Yeah. Go on your phone, see how the live works. Hey guys, we'll be ready to roll in a few minutes. We'll just wait for some people to log on. Be ready to roll in a few minutes. As they come in, just do that. You click a little button. You'll see. Camera's good? Yeah. Cool. All right, guys, if you have any questions, in the comments of the last post, there's um, a phone number in there that you can text message. It'll come right to uh, one of our tablets here. The phone number is 732-693-3006, and I'll answer any questions that you guys may have. Um, bear with me with the technology stuff here. I'm not so good at the tablets and that. We'll get started in a few minutes. Just see who's on here. Like. How's the lighting look good? You look perfect. No, the lighting. Oh. Not my beard, the lighting. The lighting's great too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me get this message back open. Again, phone number is 732-693-3006. I should have wrote it down there so everybody could see it. Doug Drash wants to know where you are in New Jersey. It's TPB represented. PB. Oh. Um, we are in Middletown, New Jersey. Lincroft, to be precise. <laughs> hey, Doug, by the way. All right, how many people did show up on the top left? 13. Cool. All right, we'll get started then. All right, guys, so the topic of tonight's uh, little live performance is uh, first aid kits and their contents. So um, if you have any questions relating to that, you can shoot them through that phone number against us. Uh, Area code 732-693-3006. But I'm going to be stripping down some of our first aid kits that I have around me here um, and going over some other equipment that I have put to the side. Um, just some stuff that we carry as guides or some recommendations that you guys should carry as an outdoor enthusiast or whatever you're doing. So um, <clears throat> I have a bunch of bulleted items that I'd like to go over. Um, again, don't forget to text that number with any questions or if you have my cell phone number, which I'm not giving out on here, but you guys can text that as well. Um, so increased popularity of outdoor activities like hiking, rock climbing, backpacking, um, canyoneering, various activities has just increased the need for um, wilderness medical training. 
and wilderness, the whole field of wilderness medicine is rapidly evolving into um, a whole structured, uh, not, I wouldn't say, more, yeah, I guess more like a separate discipline as far as, um, you know, rock climbing, backpacking goes. It's definitely its own discipline. It has its own set of protocols, it's well established, and uh, it has a somewhat standardized curriculum that's been um, going back and forth. People have been butting their heads trying to figure out a standardized way to instruct these courses as far as wilderness medicine goes, which has various different levels on the BLS and ALS level. Um, there's a, a few companies out there that are kind of keeping that standardized curriculum. Center for Wilderness Safety, which is a great one. I, I love those guys. Cliff is awesome over there. Great instructor, great instructors that are uh, teaching for them. Knowles is a, another good one. There's a few others out there. There's probably maybe six that are following the fairly standardized curriculum. Um, and it goes on classroom time, compared to uh, scenarios or based with that. But wilderness medical training is definitely something you should get into. Um, what is wilderness medicine? People can uh, argue about this definition. There's various definitions. There's a national definition in the US, then there's an international definition. What I consider wilderness medicine is one to two hours from definitive care. You don't have, it doesn't have to be remote. You don't have to be in the mountains. You don't have to be in the wilderness. Um, I'm not sure of the actual definition of wilderness. My definition of it is the Department of the Interior's definition, but I'm sure there's some pretty, pretty extensive definition as far as that's concerned. But one thing about wilderness medicine that I'd like to point out is improvisation of your equipment. Um, you can use things in your environment, what's in your backpack, what's on your person, what's in your buddy's backpack, what's in your partner's backpack. Um, gear that you're using, you know, if you're out there kayaking or skiing, learn how to use some of that equipment as far um, for splints to reset bones, like a traction splint, sea collars, backboards, um, but improvising stuff in your environment or your surrounding area definitely is a great thing. Uh, wilderness medical training, um, as an outdoor adventure guide, which, which I am uh, full time, we're mountain guides, uh, search and rescue instructors. Um, Wilderness medical training is part of our job. There's a real low level, which would be wilderness first aid, and then there's a real high level, which is a remote paramedic. And I'm sure there's other levels that are coming up, but as far as the US is concerned, those are the ones that are recognized. Um, so the first one would be wilderness first aid, then there's uh, wilderness advanced first aid. Wilderness first aid is usually, say like 16 to 20 hours of good courses. Um, anything less than that, it ends up being like a crash course, but it is definitely a crash course into wilderness medicine. Wilderness Advanced First Aid, that's more of a bridge course that um, it's for people who can't take the time commitment of Wilderness First Responder, which is usually seven to 10 days and a little more in depth, about 80 hours. Wilderness Advanced First Aid is like a bridge between first aid and first responder. Um, those classes really don't come up very much. They're, they're really not common. Wilderness First Aid is usually um, a standardized thing that's a requirement to be a guide uh, to work with any scouting organization in a wilderness setting. That's definitely a great one. And there's a lot of great instructors. I always put Center for Wilderness Safety out there first. I, I love those guys. I love their courses. I love what they do. Um, just a great organization. Um, and then some higher levels are the Wilderness First Responder. That one's usually around 80 to 100 hours. Um, that's a great one. That's, uh, that's kind of like the minimum standard in the industry as far as guiding goes. Wilderness first aid is a requirement, but wilderness first responder is usually like the minimum standard. Uh, then there's OEC, which is outdoor emergency care. <clears throat> That's more for um, more for ski patrol, but it definitely is a great class. That one's like 100 to 120 hours. Then there's wilderness EMT. <clears throat> um, that's what I have. Wilderness EMT is great. You can either take a 30-day class or you can take a module if you if you already hold a, an, EM, an urban EMT certification. I went that route, so I became a New Jersey EMT, and then I took um, three different Wilderness EMT modules from three different organizations. And then the next one would be um, your ALS level. That's your Wilderness EMT A's. So um, there's a few organizations that offer that certification. Um, I've taken two of those. So to become a Wilderness EMT Advanced, that's more on the ALS level. They talk about more patient stabilization for a long period of time, um, advanced airway management. And then there's um, Wilderness EMT P. Uh, so that would be a Wilderness EMT Paramedic. That's usually a paramedic that has taken a Wilderness EMT class. And then you have a remote paramedic. That's a specific, specific skill there. There's only, I think there's only two of them in the state of New Jersey. There's only a few of those. Uh, remote Medical is a, a company that teaches that certification. That's a great one. But all of them are part of pre-hospital care. 
Um, all right, so moving on to first aid kits. So we're going to talk about what to carry. Um, definitely don't carry things you don't need. Um, I carry everything I know how to use that's in my scope of training that I'm going to need for the environment that I'm working in. Um, this is my go-to first aid kit that I usually keep with me. I have various setups of this kit. Um, when putting together your kit, you want to think about the activity that you're going to be in or doing or conducting. Um, let me turn that back on a bit, blur it. <laughs> Sorry guys, the light went out. Um, you want to think about the activity that you're doing and what hazards that you may encounter in that environment or during that activity that you're doing or that are in and around that environment that you'll be in. Um, some basic, uh, that sh there are some basics that should be in every first aid kit, you know, from band-aids to gauze pads, there are a, a basic list. Um, <clears throat> And then there's activity or trip specific items that you want to keep in your first aid kit. Um, those things are, uh, let's say you're rock climbing or canyoneering, you want to keep some more heavy trauma items because head injuries are a little more common in that type, in that activity. So you want to keep more of those items. Um, <clears throat> as far as uh, first aid kits go, I always look for a nice waterproof bag. Um, and then inside here is my actual first aid kit. I'll open it up for you guys. And when I say waterproof bag, make sure it's waterproof. It's not water resistant. There's a lot of companies out there that swear that their bags are waterproof and um, more than half of them are not waterproof. So make sure that it's waterproof. This is a heavy nylon bag. I love these. These are Lucky Stone. We have these in a few different sizes that we stick first aid kits in. Um, just like a dry bag that you would bring kayaking or canyoneering or uh, canoeing, something like that. And then inside there is my actual bag. This is just an Adventure Medical Kits bag. I've had this specific bag for a pretty long time. We have a few of these. Uh, this is a great bag. I like Adventure Medical Kits makes great kits. I, I don't want to bash them, but some of them, um, they do make great kits for, uh, not for professionals, but more for um, your avid uh, outdoor enthusiast. So if you're going rock climbing, pick up one of their kits. If you're going kayaking, pick up one of their kits. But as far as guiding goes, or being on a professional level, their kits definitely don't have the right items for that profession. Um, and I'm sure they're working their way towards it. They have their comprehensive kits, which have a, a little more equipment in there. But um, I, I do love Adventure Medical Kits for, for several reasons. But again, I dislike them for several reasons. It's just like the Sawyer Company. They're great for water purifications, but they created this extractor thing for snake bites, which is just ridiculous. I'm not going to get into that. Um, so as far as first aid kits go, Adventure Medical Kits came up with this great design where when you open your kit up, everything is readily accessible and easy to find. I, I love that idea that they, or that concept that they came up with. It's really cool. Um, and I'll start going through my kit and showing you what I have in here. I just want to make sure I address these bulleted points that I have here. Oh, that was a question that came in. I'll answer that in a second. Um, so bag choice again. Water. I like waterproof. What did you say? The tablet. Yeah, move it. Yeah, can't see. Oh, sorry. Let me put this over here. You want to see what's in your magic bag? <laughs> oh, we're gonna go through this magic bag in a minute. <laughs> All right. So bag choice. Waterproof. One thing. Again, waterproof, not water resistant. Um, I, I'm not sure if Adventure Medical Kit still sells their bags empty anymore. Um, I know Chinook Med does sell them. Um, Cliff at Center for Wilderness Safety on their restock kit sells empty bags, but uh, th definitely get a good bag where things are labeled inside. I like, I always look for a really organized kit or a very, or with labeling around it. Those are definitely some things that I look for in a kit. Um, I want to make sure that it fully opens and spreads out like you see out here in front of me. So I want to have the kit open so I can do whatever I need to do. I don't need to start flipping things or digging around for things. I know that in this section right here, it's wound care and burn and blister management. So everything for that's in there. I know right here, first aid manual, medications and instruments are in there. Um, and then down here we have fracture and sprain. So your orthopedic section, then heavy bleeding and CPR is down here. Um, so it's definitely a, a pretty well-managed kit. Um, we'll go over the contents in a, in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> so organization, um, make sure your kit is easily opened. So you should have, um, this thing is just a mid a midpoint zipper right smack down the middle. Um, and I keep it inside this pouch just for safety, re just for um, so nothing gets damaged in there when I'm, when I'm working. <clears throat> Most of our trips are roped activities, and they usually involve 
waterfall rappelling and canyoneering. That's our most popular activity. So I'm usually out guiding those. So that's why I keep it in this heavy uh, five liter ditty sack or a dry bag. That's definitely a great one. Um, and I also uh, let everybody know where that kit is in my backpack as well. I, I have a, a little stack of backpacks here, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so again, organization. Organization is definitely key to success as far as a first aid kit goes, especially if you're on a professional level, if you're guiding um, or you're an interpretive hiker working for a park service, um, summer camp counselor um, in, in a more uh, remote setting or adventure setting. Um, organization is definitely key to success. Um, it's key to, pro to a properly managed medical scene. It's uh, key to a safe and properly treated patient. Um, it's key to transferring medical care to a, a medevac or an ambulance or ALS if they arrive on scene. Um, and it's also a key to a timely managed scene as well, or transferring care to a time, in a timely manner. Um, so a well-organized kit. Um, so in my backpack, I usually uh, keep my first aid kit in something that's where I can just drop my pack and access my first aid kit. Not immediately, but fairly quickly. So um, I'll use uh, my basic day climbing pack. So if I'm out there guiding for the day, um, you know, like a top rope trip or something like that, I keep my first aid kit down here in my sleeping bag compartment. Um, if I'm out backpacking overnight or mountaineering, I put it just above my sleeping bag so it can be accessed that way. Um, and then in the top of my pack, there's some items that I usually keep in there. Those are uh, more trip specific, but there's always a pair of gloves in there, a couple of band-aids, um, maybe like 50 to 100 milligrams of Benadryl. Um, just some basics in there, and then any personal medications that I may need. Um, or if there's a minor on the trip with us, we'll keep their EpiPen or their inhaler in there. An adult, they usually keep their, um, you know, uh, crisis intervention medication on their person somewhere. And we always find out where that is. Uh, that's definitely for another video, though we can discuss that. That's something you would find out as a guide in your trail at briefing or your uh, pre-trip preparation. But I keep some stuff in the top of my pack there. And then this is the pack that I use for canyoneering. My first aid kit in this pack it's usually at the bottom because I'm going in and out of this pack so frequently. I'm pulling ropes in and out, uh, equipment in and out, I'm setting up anchors and we're kind of moving in a fluid motion down through a canyon. So it's usually at the bottom. So when I'm canyoneering in, my, in a cargo pocket or um, a jacket pocket or shirt pocket, I'll keep some pretty quick items with me. And what I keep when I'm canyoneering is usually two pairs of gloves, a couple four by fours, maybe a trauma pad, again, 50 to 100 milligrams of Benadryl. Um, just some quick items that I can access while I'm telling somebody else where my kit is in my bag and how to access that specific item that I may need for that. Um, and then some other backpacks that I have. This is just a day pack that I'll bring on a, maybe like a waterfall repelling trip, I'll bring this one. Again, the, um, the first aid kit's usually in the bottom of these packs. It's really hard. They're top access, they're great for the activity, but as far as guiding goes, there are specific backpacks that work better. These ones just work for me. Um, this one I, we bring on our, myself and our guys bring these on our, cat, our um, caving trips that we do up in New York. These ones are pretty good. In the front pack, I'll keep some, it has a waterproof zipper. This is a Gecko brand backpack. Gecko makes some really cool products as far as their backpacks go. And we have a lot of their uh, phone cases as well. I love their stuff. Um, I'm actually not sure what else they make. Do you know what else they make? Pretty much just waterproof bags and cases and whatnot. Yeah, they make great they stuff. They do this a lot one. smaller bags as well, like um, uh, key bags and things like that. But oh. And their waterproof zippers are nice, but I'll keep some quick items in the front. Our caving trips, we're usually getting uh, not saturated at this level. It's usually saturated from waist down, but, you know, chest up, it's usually, um, you know, fairly water resistant. But these, these bags are waterproof. So I'll keep some quick items in the front here you know, along with an extra headlamp. And then I'll let everybody know where my first aid kit. Again, it's usually in my caving pack. It's probably in the top because I don't usually access any equipment in there readily unless there's some kind of issue or, you know, I'm deploying a small rope for some problem. But again, it's usually fit pretty well accessible. And another thing about first aid kits I'd like to point out, <clears throat> um, this bright red high-vis color. Everything in your backpack should have a different color than red. Make your first... Make your first aid kit a bright high-vis color, and red is definitely an international symbol, just like this cross here for first aid. Um, so definitely make it a, a good pack, like or a good bright red bag. I have a smaller model here, and I have a few other first aid kits. This is a cheap one we got off Amazon. Um, 
we go through first aid kits really quickly because they don't get used very often, but they get thrown in and out of equipment very often. Um, so we want something that's fairly durable. Um, so I like these adventure medical kits, best bags in the market. I, there's hands down, man. I don't care what anybody says about any other bag. This bag I have put through the ringer and we have multiple bags and they've lasted us close to 12 years already. This bag right here is 13 years old. <laughs> there isn't a, a wear on it. I've never had to deal with the zippers. Great bag. This one is the one that we give out to our guides. Um, this one's a little more durable. Um, it has a, some organizational pockets in there, but this is good for maybe a day trip or um, in a dry environment if we're rock climbing or something like that. So we'll move some bags over here. And then I have another one. This is a fanny pack style, bringing some 80s back. We had a girl that worked for us. Um, her name was Sam. I ha we give this out to any of our kayaking guides or our river guides. They have a, a main bag with them, and then they have this one that they keep on their person. They keep some quick items in here that they would... You know, for injuries they would encounter on a river for our river tubing trips, like um, after bite for bee stings or something like that. Um, you know, maybe a couple, uh, some Benadryls in there, a couple Band-Aids, nothing crazy, sunscreen. But I handed this to her, and she says, uh, I didn't know this job came with sex appeal. Best comment ever. But yeah, fanny packs are definitely back in, but we've been using them for a long time. These are, these are pretty good. You can, it's readily accessible right here in front of you. I don't like wearing fanny packs. Um... It's not something I do. I usually keep my first aid kit in a dry bag if I'm kayaking right in front of me underneath my uh, cargo, um, cargo stove so I can just grab the bag and do what I need to do. All right, so bag choices. We went over that. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything here that I wanted to address. All right, so next one, brand name and quality products. Brand name really isn't a big one. I do, I do stress that in some of our classes, like our hiking guide courses or our mountain leader classes, but um, just good quality products. That, that's my problem with all these companies that create these kits, is the quality of their products. Um, their gauze pads are like loose leaf paper folded up. Um, their products are really bad. They're just really not good. I keep quality products in our bags. Our bags are put together, originally were put together by, by uh, MDs, so they're, everything that we need is in this bag. Um, for daily use or for client use, nobody goes in my first aid kit unless there's some type of serious issue. So usually if there's, um, I don't want to have any problem, I want to know what's missing, I want to know what was used, I want to make sure there's no cont cross-contamination happening. So I go in my first aid kit and I'll pull out what they need. If there's a, a serious injury or some type of, um, like a, we call it a compromised first aid kit where things are ripped open for a heavy problem, that's a completely different story. Then our kits aren't used again. We take them back to the shop, we strip them down, clean everything. If anything has, um, you know, a package that can be cleaned, we clean the package before we put it back in and then we throw a lot of things away during that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if your kit's compromised, definitely keep that in mind. You want to break it down and clean it out, throw out any contaminated items, um, and then I'll wash the bag as well just to make sure everything's clean on it. <clears throat> All right, bag choice. We talked about carrying what you need. Definitely don't carry useless stuff. Um, I was on a trip one time with uh, the Boy Scouts, and they pulled out their first aid kit, and it was this uh, tackle box. It was huge. It was probably like two feet wide, a foot and a half high, and it opened up and it had multiple layers, and this guy had everything under the sun in this bag. Um, really great idea, but there was nobody there that had more than a wilderness first aid um, level, so they really couldn't use a lot of the stuff that was in that kit. But you're not um, talking about the kitty band-aids, are you? What'd you say? Those aren't useless. Kitty band-aids? Yeah. The, the heckler behind the camera is speaking about kitty band-aids. They make people happy. Yeah, she keeps... Kitty Band-Aids, Bob Ross Band-Aids. We definitely got you covered as far as that goes. When a child gets injured, they smile. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I talked about location of backpack. Um, again, I let all my clients know where my backpack is, but I do keep some items for, you know, superficial wounds or if like I'm canyoneering, I'll keep some stuff for heavy wounds, readily accessible, something fairly quick and easy. You know, any, any type of injury that may arise in that environment. Um, what else are we going to go over here? All right, now we'll get into the kit then. I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to address. No questions yet besides that one, which is way down in the list here. I'll go over it in a few minutes. How many people does it say at the top left? 
Seven. Cool. All right. So my first aid kit. So we're going to break some things down here. Um, the first section on, we'll go on the outside first. Um, right in this little pocket here, I keep uh, soap notes, uh, usually a mechanical pencil or a pencil that I can sharpen with a knife. Pens are tend to wear out. Um, they might bleed into your bag. We've had that happen a few times. So usually a, a pencil is good. Mechanical pencils, um, they're okay. They Sometimes they'll puncture the bag, so be cautious with them. You can uh, put a rubber tip on them or something. Um, but a golf pencil, that's probably a good one, or just snap a pencil off. Um, and then some soap notes. Well, I'm not going to go in more in depth of these, but if you're a medical professional, it's just your patient care report, your PCR. Um, I keep uh, usually uh, three of these in here. I think there's, there's a uh, yeah, there's three here. So I keep them folded up in here. Um, actually, the ones that I have here are actually from the Center for Wilderness and Safety. Again, I'm pretty sure Cliff sells these on his website. It even says Center for Wilderness and Safety up top. <laughs> Cliff but, is here. Is he? Yes. Hi, Cliff. I love you, man. You can rub bellies one day. <laughs> but yeah, soap notes are great. I keep them in a, a pocket on the outside of my uh, pack. Um, Sometimes for soap notes, if I don't have time to grab that, I'll just slap a piece of tape on my leg and fill out any uh, pertinent information before I get into that. All right, so opening up the kit, the first flap here, I have um, a SAM splint. This, this pack that I have has a great area to put that. The only problem is the SAM splint tends to get damaged a lot, but here's a, a newer SAM splint. But this one's kind of crushed and conformed into there. SAM splints are great, definitely an addition you should have in there. And I'm sure there's a few companies that make these. I've only seen one other one. There's a uh, the Guardian, but um, SAM splints are great. And we'll talk about that when we get to that section. So in my uh, wound care section, let me make sure I'm not skipping around here. All right, so wound management over here. This is where I'm gonna keep um, gauze pads, band-aids. I carry a few of each item, uh, fairly large. I'll carry a few, um, you know, just quick surgical sponges and then I'll carry some sterile gauze pads for various injuries. Um, and then we get into some smaller gauze pads, some 3 by 3s 2 by 2s some non-stick gauze pads. Those are always good to have. Um, and I put all of my items in Ziploc bags. It just it helps me organize them better in my backpack. There may be some other organizational method that you may use for your backpacks. Um, the way my first aid kit is constructed is what, is what I've encountered out there in the field. Um, I worked as an urban EMT for uh, close to 10 years. I have a few thousand calls under my belt. And then as far as search and rescue and... Uh, mountain rescue and wilderness medicine goes, I probably have, um, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 calls on my belt. So this system works for me. And then as far as guiding goes, I've been a full-time guide for a very long time. So this kit is set up perfect for me, for what I need. Band-Aids I keep in a Ziploc bag. That one is usually a commonly used item, especially when we do our summer camp program. So I usually keep a lot of them in the top of my backpack so I don't have to keep opening up my first aid kit because kids get little boo-boos all the time. Even adults get them. Um, some of our guides carry some fairly amusing band-aids with them. Bob Ross band-aids, Batman, whatever works for you. Okay. Um, but as far as wound management goes, I carry various sizes. I don't carry like knuckle and, you know, those little round band-aids, things like that. Those may work for you. I found no need for them whatsoever. So I'll carry just your standard stripped band-aids. Um, and then some large ones for some heavier items. Um, and I carry good Band-Aids too. They're definitely ma usually made by Band-Aid. I try to use the cloth ones as much as possible. Um, first aid kits, I have yet to see a first aid kit that comes with a good quality Band-Aid. They're always some cheap plastic. They have too much elasticity to them and they end up stretching and cutting off circulation, especially if you put them on a finger. Um, they cause a lot of problems. So I like the cloth Band-Aid, so we always keep those. Um, also in this wound management area are Steri strips of various sizes. These are great for um, just for wound management as far as, I'd say more for superficial type wounds. You're not really gonna use these on, I mean you can, but you wouldn't really use these on cuts and lacerations. You wanna bandage those up with something that's gonna soak up a lot of blood. Um, steri strips definitely aren't good for that. Um, pretty much it for the wound section there. And then I have a heavier wound section where there's heavier bleeding. Let me make sure I cover everything here. Um, and the only other thing that's not in this kit, which is in this kit, is the uh, Tegaderm. That stuff's great for like a, a minor injury and you want to kind of monitor it. It has that clear film. Um, I believe it was originally made for like IV start kits when they put it over your IV. I'm not positive about that. Um, but Tegaderm is definitely a good product. 
Uh, what else? Okay, so my heavy bleeding section is right down in here. That one's, again, in this type of first aid kits right over here. It says bleeding and CPR on it. I love this organizational method where it says everything in there. Some of this has, this is actually the only thing that's worn off on this kit in 12 or 13 years is some of the writing. Otherwise, this kit is just, I love these kits. Um, so uh, bleeding and CPR. In here, I have uh, some quick clot, just a clotting sponge. I don't think they make the powder anymore. I'm not positive. I know there's a lot of problems with that. I'm sure if Cliff's still watching, he could probably answer that question in the comments for us. Cliff's a, a wilderness medicine junkie. <laughs> He's definitely a great guy. Uh, I keep uh, some BSI, some body substance isolation equipment in here. Um, I wear glasses, so I don't keep a, a pair of uh, safety glasses in there, but definitely keep a pair in somewhere in there or keep them on your person. But I have a, um, a mask in there. I have a CPR mask in here. Um, I have a few heavy trauma pads, so a eight by tens, five by nines, and they're thick, heavy, good quality pads. I don't keep any cheap equipment in here. That's an, sorry. So we got trauma pads here. These ones are great. I like Everybody these, these extra absorbent eight by tens. You can use uh, maxi pads too in place of this, but these ones are, are definitely good. Just get a, a good quality pad. This is a, this is a company that makes cheaper products, this caring company, but this absorbent pad is just really good, so I like that one. I like it a lot better than Johnson & Johnson's um, trauma pad. Definitely for uh, various injuries, it, it worked out well for me, so I keep that with me. It may not work out for you, but whatever works for you. Put some of that back in. Again, I keep a couple five by nines in there. Let me stuff some of this stuff back in here. And then I have a fracture, so an orthopedic section, so fracture and sprains. Um, I keep a couple cravats in here, which are triangular bandages. I always have at least two in my pack. Right now, there's three in here. Um, some other items that you can keep in that section are going to be, I pulled them out already. There's some cold compresses. Um, I usually keep small cold compresses. We have these little 4 by 5s These ones are nice. Um, or 3x3s. Uh, three I can fit two of these in my backpack. We use these a lot during uh, our summer camp trips. A lot of kids get, you know some localized injuries to their, their ankles or their wrists, or um, they get a bee sting or something like that, or a bug bite, and we put this right over. This thing's great. So these little tiny ones, these are uh, um, Ducal. I like these, they work out pretty well. They don't last very long, but they're definitely good. Um, this is a cheap one that was in one of the first aid kits that we had to buy. Again, like I said, we try not to buy pre-manufactured kits. Um, we like to put them together ourselves. We know where the products are in there. We know where they're coming from. We know that they're good quality products. But this one is just a different size, so I wanted to show that to you. And then we have some larger ones. These are kind of hard to put in your pack, these really big guys. But if you order a, you know, a cold pack or an instant uh, ice pack off of the internet, you're going to get one of these guys, these big 6 by 9s But you know, if they fit in your kit, they work out well for you, go for it. So that's pretty much it for there. I might carry, uh, depends on the trip. You know, if it's a roped activity, I'll stick a, a finger splint in there. Um, fingers get jammed up sometimes, especially um, in our canyoneering trips where we're, we're kind of, we're moving in a fluid motion, but we're kind of moving fast. We are having a lot of fun during those trips, but we had the trips down to a science because we do them every single day of the week for eight months out of the year. So we flow through our trips very quickly. So I keep some of those items in there just for issues that may arise like that. But you can put some small sand splints in there. They make little finger splints now. Those are great. Um, all right, so that goes over. That's wound management and splinting. Um, some other items that you can keep in there for splinting, you can like rock tape or KT tape, things like that. So definitely some other good items. So one other thing that I didn't mention, which eh, we could mention in a few minutes. We'll talk about blister care in a few minutes. But now we're going to get into meds a little bit here. Um, as far as prescribed medication goes, um, if you're not traveling internationally on some type of expedition where you're in a remote environment or a hostile environment for a long period of time, you really shouldn't have prescribed meds in your first aid kits, they should, unless it's a minor. That's the only time that we keep them, and then I keep them in a pocket. It's usually some type of crisis intervention medication, like an EpiPen, an inhaler, um, something of that nature. So I'll keep those outside of my first aid kit. But if you are going on a trip, traveling to another country, those are definitely things you can get from... Um, a doctor prescribed for you for that, like z packs and things like that. But I don't keep those in my first aid kit. We used to carry EpiPens in here, um, but we no longer carry those. That was years ago. They were getting damaged because we weren't using them. And usually if somebody has an allergy, they have their own EpiPen. Um, but if not, we have Benadryl that's readily accessible that we can get down their, down their throats. But that's definitely something for another video. 
All right, so we're going to get into OTCs, which are um, over-the-counter drugs. I have a whole wide selection of them in here. Um, I have them all, most of them, actually 99% of them are in these little single-use packets. Um, rarely do we, we have to use these, but it's good to have them in a single-use packet. Some extra strength Tylenol. Um, I usually carry a couple of those. Uh, Benadryl. I have Benadryl all over the place. This seems to be a, a common one that we use out there. It's always in the top of my packs. I keep it in my emergency on my person kits um, if I may need it for some odd reason. A few packets of Motrin, some ibuprofen. Um, I try not to keep generic brands in here. People are kind of cautious on um, consuming some of those generic brands. Um, the only thing good about generic pills are they don't have the can well, most of them don't have the candy coating on them, which if people have a food dye allergy or something like that, it could be a problem. Um, so that's a, that is probably the one pro and plus of keeping a generic medication. But I have some Dayquil in here, some Claritin, Pepto, Zantac, some random stuff. Some of them are multiples. Um, yeah. You know, like a acetaminophen or aspirin or like that, I'll keep multiple companies. But some people like a leave over this, over that. So at least we have those options for people. Um, and then I keep a couple packets of water purification, um, which the reason why I have that in there, I'll leave that out so I don't forget that. We'll talk about that. <clears throat> also in my OTC section is uh, some glucase SO or glucose SOS. We used to carry the tubes of the glucose. Or glutose, those were great, but they were um, busting open in some of our kits, so we we're having problems. So this one's a powder. It has a longer shelf life. Um, this one's great. I like this one. Um, I've used this probably, maybe not two dozen times, but but probably close to it. Probably about eighteen to twenty times on patients um, or subjects. Never clients. For some, knock on wood, all the injuries that we usually treat are either on a rescue call or they're people that are doing the activities while we're out there and. We're not going to completely ignore them, you know, if there's some type of issue that arises out there. So we'll, we'll stabilize our clients in one location. I'll leave them with an assistant guide and then I'll go or the lead, other lead guide will go, whoever the highest level of uh, medical certification goes out and deals with the problem. So we've used these uh, various times. The last time I used this was actually in the Catskills. Some people were stuck in a canyon and we gave them um, a couple of these and some water and um, some rehydration salt and for that well. So glucose, we talked about that, some OTCs. As far as OTCs go, yes, you probably should always keep them in um, these single-use packets. But if you see those smaller ones where they're, sometimes they're like 6 to 10 capsules, those are great. Because remember what I said in the beginning of the video, I'm the only one that goes in this first aid kit. I don't go and say, hey, John, you said you needed a Tylenol. They're in this section under there. Go in there and grab them. I always go in there and I get them out. So there's no cross-contamination happening as far as pills go. So that's the way that I avoid that. And I'm a stickler with that as far as that goes. Um, nobody goes in this first aid kit digging around unless it's myself. Um, and it's usually with a gloved hand if there's any kind of serious issue. Um, so rehydration choices. There's various different ones. There's emer emergency is a good one. We used to use that a lot. Um, Pedialyte powder. Um, I know I saw Cliff had those on his website. Those are great. Pick up some of those. Um, oral IV. I like to use this. This one's worked out great for me. Maybe it's just the environment, the factors of the situation that I was in, but I do like these. Um, they have drinks now as well, but these little small quick packet tubes, they look like eyewash. These are great. I like those. Um, and then some other items I have in here. I do have some eyewash, some eye flush. This I wash is great, these little tubes, but again, they're little tubes, um, so they're not so great, but they'll work out if there's something small in there. Usually you have to use a bottle of water, an unopened bottle of water, or some purified water. We usually have to use the flush eyes out. Um, you know, it depends on what's in there, but this stuff, this stuff works out because you can kind of direct where you want to squirt it, which is nice. Um, that's it for rehydration salts and glucose. There's other types of glucose, just make sure that you look at the expiration date, especially if it's some type of... Uh, fluid or paste form because they they don't last very long all right a few other items let's see what else we got here so tool choices and that's going to be like tweezers syringes and things like that um i used to keep a, a bp cuff and um a stethoscope in here but i don't keep those anymore um i just never really use them as far as that goes for monitoring vitals we usually if there's an issue we try and extract them as quickly as possible whether they're a client a, a subject on a call or whatever so we try and get them out of the that environment as quickly as possible um we'll monitor vitals when we get them out to uh safe care on their road to definitive care but um those are some good items to keep in there again gloves i have gloves 
all over. They're in every compartment in, in my bag here, even in the tool compartment. I usually have a few different types of nitrile, 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 whatever you want to call that there, gloves. Um, also in my tool compartment is a good pair of trauma shears. There's some really cheap ones I've seen on the market, um, you know, for like two bucks, but usually a pair of trauma shears is probably like five to ten dollars. Get yourself a good pair of these. these. These come in handy, and they're not just for cutting mole foam and mole skin, especially if you're an EMT. These are, these are lifesavers. They'll cut through anything. Um, also in my tool compartment, I have, I keep a small, um, like a needle tip in there for drain, for, you know, lancing any abscesses like blisters or something like that. And I also keep a number 10 scalpel for doing the same thing. I know people always say don't pop blisters, don't ever do that. But if I ever encounter, a bl I don't get blisters, but if I ever encounter them on a, on a, not a patient of mine, but if I ever encounter them on one of my clients and we're back in the back country, it's a good practice to pop the blister. Don't cut all the skin off, but just drain it, get all the pus out. It eases some comfort for them. And then you can pat it however you need to pat it slap some triple antibiotic ointment over it um, and they can go on their way. Otherwise, it's a really uncomfortable situation for them. Um, make sure. Some more tools here. Thermometers. This is always an argument in various wilderness medicine classes. I used to, well, hypothermia thermometers, we keep those, but regular thermometers, most people are going with something that you can kind of throw away, a one-use thing like temp dots. Uh, there's only like one or two companies that have those right now because of all this craziness that's going on. But I do know that I saw a post from Cliff again. I keep plugging you, Cliff. You should owe me some money for this. <laughs> but he has temp dots. I don't know how many he has left, but we have a whole bunch of them. I have, they're in, in these kits all over the place. Temp dots are great. Um, it's, just, still so funny. it's just a little strip. Um, it, it's great. I, I love those things. Um, some more items for tools here. Oh, again, but I forgot to address that. If you do have a thermometer, make sure you have sleeves that you can put over it. Make sure they're good quality sleeves. They're not paper or something like that. So you can throw them, um, you know, in the garbage when you're done taking some of these temperatures. Again, there's no cross contamination happening, especially during something like this. Um, talked about the scalpel and lancing some of those blisters and abscesses. Uh, if you want to argue with me about that, feel free to give me a call. I give you the phone number or you can call our office, but myself included, we're a really large guide service. We've been operating full time for a very long time. Knowles does the same thing and you can probably Google that and figure that out. As far as draining blisters out, that's your best option. You want to, you don't want to have somebody that's super uncomfortable limping on these blisters or having some type of problem. Just drain the pus out of them and deal with them that way. So those items are good for that. So a number 10 scalpel, not the blades, make sure it has a handle on it as well. Um, and then a small needle. Um, all right, what am I missing here? Thermometers, so we're good on that. So next one is gonna be irrigation. So whenever you deal with any type of wound, you're always gonna have to irrigate the wounds in some way. Um, do you have any of those small little irrigation syringes? Those little tiny ones? I think I used them all in the squirrels. <laughs> oh, all right. So what, the irrigation syringe that I keep is a 60 cc. This thing's like a dollar online or two dollars. It's a great one. Um, I like this. The ones that usually come with these first aid kits. Again, guys, if you have any questions you want to ask, phone number for the tablet here is 732-693-3006. You can text it on there. Um, again, 732-693-3006. But this is the one that I use. I keep these in all of our first aid kits, so we have a, a few of these. Um, those small little, I think they're like 15 or 20 cc's, those little ones that come with most first aid kits, they don't do anything. Um, I've irrigated thousands of wounds. Those are all the ones I use from the squirrels. Oh, you don't have any? No, uh, I use them all. <laughs> so you, we don't have any more. We used to keep them around like that snake kit for, um, or snake bite kit for more like amusing purposes, but she ended up using them for some squirrels that she was fostering. Um, so I use a large one um, for various reasons, but irrigating a wound, if you've ever actually irrigated a wound, you, you're not going to do any, any good with that little tiny tube that they give you that looks like, you know, you're writing somebody's name on a cake for like their birthday or something. Um, and then the classic one is people always sticking, oh, I'm just going to stick a pen in here and, you know, I make my own. They start squirting water everywhere. That's great, but you got water squirting all over the place. You got contamination from the pen going in there. Um, it definitely doesn't do the job. So these are great. I mean, you can get these. I really think these are like a dollar or two online. I can't remember what we paid for them, but we have a whole bunch of these. Um, they should be sterile. 
if you are irrigating wounds because you're putting purified water in there. Um, if you don't have purified water, you can purify the water with something like this, like a water purification method. You can boil the water, just make sure you cool it down before you put it on the wounds. You can put um, uh, betadine in there, you can mix that. You can take one of these little, I don't know if I have any in here. A lot of them from surgical supplies come in their own casing. Yeah, they're usually closed up. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they come in their own plastic closure if you get them from like surgical supplies and whatnot. Yeah, they should be closed up because remember you're you're dealing with an open wound and you're trying to irrigate it. And the reason for the irrigation is you want to remove um, any debris that may be in the cut. Um, let me make sure I'm not skipping anything there. Tools, 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 tools. Alright, we're good then. Okay, cool. I'll make sure I'm on track here. All right, so the irrigation syringe. Again, this is uh, 60 cc's. They do make larger ones, but this one fits nicely in our first aid kits. Most of our first aid kits are um, nine inches long, so we can put these right right in there, and they, and they um, in the tool section, they work out pretty well for us. Again, try to avoid those little tiny guys. You're, not, you're just gonna kill yourself trying to deal with a wound, because you're gonna squirt everything that's in there, and you're gonna move what's in there and cause more harm, I wouldn't say harm, but more pain to the person that you're treating. Um, so you're going to squirt it. You want something that can squirt it and continue pushing it away. And you want it to be directed at a single point. So that's why this tip is great. You want to remove any debris that may be in that wound there. Um, any any ex exudate, uh, surface pressure. You want to clean it. We also want to clean it so we can look at the wound as well. That's a really, besides cleaning any bacteria or pathogens or anything out of there, the, another point is so you can see the actual injury so you can treat it properly. So again, this syringe is great. I know it looks really big, but I've used this thousands of times it's great man um tourniquet uh definitely get a good quality tourniquet in there this tourniquet that is in here is not the ones that we use we use large ones but these are like the little cheap one you'll see in the hospital they're like 15 cents these are garbage i'm not really sure how that got in there all right so we went over that another thing that i keep in this little section of my first aid kit is uh, an emergency blanket and a good quality one the way that we test these this is um it says life gear, but I think somebody replaced this in the bag here. But the emergency blank or thermal blankets are really important. I always keep one in here and then I'll stick one in my backpack, depending on the trip or the time of year. But make sure it's a good one. We test these out before we buy them because we buy them in bulk. Um, so, you know, I'll buy like three or four cases of these for our guides or our clients in case we need to use them during ice climbing trips or if there's any kind of issue. Or for um, our wilderness medicine classes or um, mountain rescue or something class. But we always fold the whole thing out and we'll put some weights in the middle, kind of throw them up and down like you're at a concert tossing somebody up and down. Um, and we'll see what the the uh, thermal blanket actually does and see what, it, you know, if it rips or anything like that. Some other items in, oh, here's those tent dots. I couldn't find them in there. Lucky thing nobody had checked their fever. There's four of them. These things are great. I love these things. Well, there's six of them in there. Tent dots are nice. Some more gloves. So again, that's my OTC section or my, my tools, instruments, and medication section that I keep in the middle there. You can add whatever you want to add. It's your own, it's your own kit. This has worked for me for years. That's the reason why I use this. Um, and then right out here in the middle are some different types of tapes. Um, this is normally in there. The one that's in here is kind of worn down because I used it a, a couple of times, so there's not much left on it. Um, but this is the, like a cohesive dressing. This stuff's nice to have. It's great. It was first used in the, the veterinary market. Um, and now it's just used all over the place. Pretty, pretty widely used item. Um, that would go more so with my splinting section. Um, and then I keep some other different types of tape in here. Tape that actually sticks to human skin. Um, there's various methods you can use to make tape stick to human skin, um, besides shaving it or tincture of uh, benzoin. But I keep a good quality tape in here. I like that. That little paper tape that comes, I don't even have any, that little paper tape that comes with um, first aid kits. Let me see if I have any. No, I don't have any. Um, but again, that stuff just throw in the garbage. Well, that's a, that's a good tape too. We have that over here somewhere. Yeah. But good quality tape that sticks to your skin. And I always try and opt for the at least a two inch wide. Um, it, it's just worked out for me over the years. I can tear it down the middle if I need to or whatever size I need. Um, I can tear off a nice strip and stick it on my thigh and use it as a, you know, a, a quick uh, reference point or soap note if I want to. 
Um, some other items that I have in here underneath my wound care and blister <clears throat> is, uh, this would more so go with the bandaging and stuff, but I have various sizes of uh, gauze rolls. I have a two and a half inch, a three inch, um, right here's a four inch. Um, these are usually stowed away somewhere, but I do keep various sizes with me. Um, when, you, when you are using gauze, you're probably going to use a lot of it. The, chant, the four inch one is, is pretty good to have. I like that stuff. And then you can also cover it up with uh, an ace bandage or some type of elastic bandage, which I keep in my orthopedic section. What is that? Oh, here's her kitty band-aids. Here, you can think of that. <laughs> um, some other items that I have in this section here, in this compartment, I'll hold it up again for you just so you guys that weren't watching can take a peek. Um, I have some other treatment methods in here. These nice little pockets are great. I have some alcohol pads. You can use prep pads, but try and get the cloths that, that spread out and open up. Um, some betadine or, or the um, providon iodine, that stuff's great. Some Blistex I keep in there in small packets. You can get these on, um, these are really tiny, but minimus.biz, single use, these are great. That's a great website too, by the way. We order a lot of products from there. Um, there's some burn gel, there's water gel. Um, burn gel is great. This is a uh, safe tech. Theirs is, theirs is fairly decent. It has the same percentage of lidocaine, I think, as the water gel. It actually doesn't say, oh yeah, 2%. So it's the same as water gel. Um, great stuff though. So I keep that in there. Um, some oral pain relief I keep in there. Some afterbite. Some IVX, you know, some poisonous plant issues I can deal with. These are things that I'm going to get pretty quick. And then some afterbite. I'm not a big fan of afterbite. I do keep it. Some of our clients are big fans of it. Again, this first aid kit isn't for my personal use. I do use items out of here for myself because it's in my pack, but I have their, a personal kit that I usually use for myself if I'm out there in the back country. And it is an adventure medical kit. Um, I just changed some of the items. Another pack, little section here in the pack, I keep some triple antibiotic ointment, some anti, um, antiseptic towelettes. I usually have, I don't know, anywhere from like six to 12 of those in our pack. Those get used a lot. Um, you know, we're usually wiping some uh, superficial wounds like, um, you know, abrasions or scrapes or things like that. Um, so that's another section of there. I think that pretty much covers every main part of the kit here. Let's put this away. Again, I like a good quality first aid kit. I like things to be organized. So when I, when I kneel down on the ground or um, rappel down on a rope to treat a patient, I can open up this kit, see where everything is, and deploy whatever I need to use or locate anything that I need to use in a, in a timely fashion. We'll talk about a few other items. Anybody comment on there yet? No. I'll put that away in a second. All right, we talked about soap notes. Um, again, a good, for soap notes, you wanna use a pencil that can be uh, sharpened with a knife. Mechanical pencils are good. Again, remember I mentioned the puncturing of your first aid kit, so keep that in mind when you do use that. What? It's a paper Um. Another thing that I keep in the outside of my pack in this soap note bag, besides gloves, soap notes, and uh, a small bio bag, is some mole skin and mole foam. This stuff comes in handy. I'm going to stick it back in here for now. But uh, that stuff's great. Blister care, if you're a guide, um, not rock climbing and, you know, more rope activities, but if you're backpacking or hiking, you're going to use those items more. So whatever works for you and your kit, but make sure that when you do open up your kit, things can be found fairly easily. Um, Especially if you're one of the people that, you know, hey, go get my first aid kit. It's over there. It's in the blue bag in the section down here. You want to make sure that they can find that item in your backpack. All right. What am I missing? We talked about irrigating. Oh, tools. We didn't talk about tweezers. Again, this is another one. Um, as far as tweezers go, I have a good fine tip pair of tweezers. They work for me. They've worked for me for a long time. I'm 42 years old. I've been going to the woods since I was a little kid. Um, they work for me. There's various tick removal tools out there and all different kinds of crazy tweezers. Actually, these are the most common ones that you see in first aid kit that you buy, like a commercial one. These are a joke. I don't even, I don't know who makes these or why they make these, but these don't do anything. You can't get anything out with these tweezers. If you have successfully removed anything from your body with these tweezers, please call me. I'd love to know. Um, or send us pictures. <laughs> you want a good quality tweezer. These, you could probably buy nine dozen of these for like a dollar. But we have good quality stainless steel first aid kits. Um, <clears throat> you want to opt for something stainless steel. Definitely a surgical grade stainless steel or something in the 300 series, like 370 or something stainless steel is always good with a fine tip on it. 
Um, I saw a brand and I can't remember the name of it. They're really stubby and they have a, they almost have like a scalpel like tip on them. They're really sharp. Those are pretty good. Those do a little bit of damage to your skin. Um, but they definitely get out what you need to get out. Um, and they work out really well because they're, um, the way the tip is the blade, I'm not sure of the right word for it, but the blade works both ways. So when you do dig it into a wound, you can spread it open and grab something at the same time with with a regular pair of tweezers, you can't do that. It kind of tapers the wound down before you actually get to the uh, obstruction that you're trying to remove. Um, and then fine tip, they're great for ticks because you can just grab them right above their little mouth parts. Excuse me. And you can pull them out. Those tick twisters or tick whatever they're called, I forget the name of them, or the tornado. I'm not a big fan of those. Um, they tend to do more damage than good and you could tear the tick's head off and... They're just really bad. Then you got all kinds of pathogens or who knows what's coming out of a tick falling on you there. But a good fine tip pair of tweezers are good. Make sure I didn't skip any tools here. That's probably it that I keep. All right. And then a few other, one other tool that I didn't mention is just a couple little pieces of webbing. It's, they're stowed in my backpack. Just like a one inch tubular webbing. Um, something like this. And you could do various things with it. You can use it for splinting. Um, you know, like an, uh, an ankle brace for a traction splint if you're improvising, something like that. But these are good for various reasons, and, and not just first aid, but I usually keep like two two-foot pieces in there. <clears throat> All right, make sure I got everything here. That is pretty much it. All right, so we're going to talk about a few other items. So that's everything I wanted to go over on this little bullet list. Again, if you guys have any questions, you can text 732 Six, oh, I keep forgetting this password on here. I have to ask I don't throw that down for I forget all the time. <laughs> um, it's like a finger pattern. Uh, 732 693 3006. Um, some other items that I'd like to build upon a first aid kit, um, depending on what you're doing. We did talk about Sam Splints. Um, Sam Splints are great. There's a few companies you can get these in different colors now, too. Um, olive drab, orange, yellow. Um, I think Sam Splint only makes the olive drab or the orange. I'm not positive about that. Um, but sand splints are great. They come in different sizes. There's a bigger one as well. Actually, not only did I use these in a wilderness setting, we used these in a, an urban setting as well. I used to keep a few of these on the ambulance. Actually, I think the last time I used these was when we were at the rock gym when that girl fell and broke her ankle. Yeah, yeah the, the EMTs came in to treat the patient. Um, I had already um, started treating her and uh, the EMT came in and he pulled this out of the bag and he didn't know how to use it. So I quickly did what we need to do with it. But these things are great. They're really flexible, but when you make them into like an I-beam or C-beam or H-beam or something, they work out really well. They're fairly rigid. So those are good. Um, some other items, a good rescue mask or CPR mask. I have the shields in all of our kits just because they're easy to put in there, but these are always good to have as well. These are just a better option um, for various reasons. Um, but this, this is a little better. If you do have the room or you want to use something like this, this is always nice to have. I do bring this with us when we're doing water activities like kayaking or canoeing, I'll keep this because there's more room where I can put a bag down. I'm not carrying it on my person. Um, we talked about Steri strips. We, again, there's a few different sizes here. Once you open up one of these bags, you probably should toss it out if you're not using them all. Unfortunately, they do put a lot of Steri strips in one of these bags, so you're kind of throwing some of them away. But you're you don't want to have any issues because if you're dealing with if you're putting a Steri strip on somebody, it's not like a heavy wound. You know, it's not going down to like some heavy tissue or subcutaneous level, but you are putting it on a wound and there's probably going to be blood or something involved. So you want to just toss these old ones in the garbage. And then I have a few different sizes. These are um, eighth inch by three inch. These are half inch by four inch. A few sizes for dealing with wounds. You know, we, we do have some suturing materials, but that's, um, there's arguments as far as whether that's a surgical or, or an aesthetic procedure, but um, if there's a, a situation where we did have to do that, if we were in a really remote environment, we're going to deal with that problem in the woods. We'll worry about an infection when we get out, but we're going to get that patient stabilized and get them out of the woods or the or the a remote environment. But again, that is a surgical procedure, so you really shouldn't be doing that in the back country. But steri strips are good for that because you can tear these off, open the wound back up, and then they can irrigate it maybe a little differently in the hospital, depending on their uh, protocols or SOPs. And then I have a small little... Dense tech kit. I'm not sure you can get these anymore, but you can get the items that are in them. It's like 12 bucks. I used to bring this on our larger trips where we were out there for an extended period of time, just in case. Only had to use little things in here a couple of times. 
Um, there are some good uh, good items in here. Um, and then some more advanced items. Here's that other face shield that I was talking about. This one's nice. Um, this is the one that's in there. It's just opened up a little bit, but I always keep one of these too. These are nice to have in your pocket. You can pin them in the top of your pack with a little keychain. We sell these on our website. I think Cliff sells them as well. Um, some airway kits, oral airways. These are great. We have a nasal airway kit in here as well. Um, and then some sterile water. We used to bring these on a lot of our trips along with some small bottles of oxygen, depending on what we were doing and where we were going. Um, we still have a bunch of these left. Um, I think I use these more at home for my kids than anything else now, um, or if we're on a heavy trip. This kit right here is a heavier trauma kit. So this kit would go with us if we're doing trail maintenance, or we have a really large group where we might have to deal with that. So these items are just extra items that would be in addition to a first aid kit. So like I said, there's an airway kit in here. There's a couple bottles of this water. There's a lot heavier items um, as far as gauze pads go, some heavier trauma pads, some large ace bandage, like a three and a half inch and a four inch, and uh, some glucose stuff. This stuff's nice. This is the 15. They make a smaller one. I think it's like a 45 or something. I've never used this stuff in the wilderness. I've used the powder. I've used this in uh, on an ambulance numerous times. This stuff works out pretty well. You usually end up using you know, two or three tubes of it. That's why it's usually in a three pack. That stuff's good. I think it's like five bucks a tube. That stuff's nice. Then there's some more tape in this pack as well. Again, tape is really important. Good quality tape. There's so many different companies. I like J&J's tape, Johnson & Johnson. They make different types of tapes, but try and avoid that little thin paper tape that you usually see in these pre-manufactured first aid kits or these commercialized ones. I like a good quality tape for various reasons. And when you start treating injuries or if you're a medical professional, you already know the reason why we look for a good quality tape. I mean, I'm not talking about tape like IV tape where you put it on your skin, you have to have like your, your mom come and pull it off you because it rips off all your hair. Like a good tape, it's not gonna do too much damage to your skin, but it's gonna do the job that it needs to do. Um, that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's all the items. That is everything. If you guys have any questions, you can send them to 732-693-3006. You can email us. You can Facebook message us, Instagram message us. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, that silly little TikTok website we just created a page on. But it's all any guiding on all these. Uh, YouTube, any guiding as well. We have a lot of really neat videos. There'll be a lot more up as well. Um, I think I covered everything I wanted to cover during this video. If you guys have any questions, shoot them over. Um, Tell them how you want Pinky in videos. Yeah, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> um, if you guys do have any questions as far as wilderness medicine goes, you can direct them to us or we can direct you to a, a different source as well, um, whichever works for you. But uh, have a great night, guys.